In this mini tutorial, we're going to look at the very basic features of the retina um, and consider some of the clinical relevance of knowing about this. Um, first of all, let's take a look at the, the, the very simple architecture of the retina. Uh, and what we've got here is we're, we're looking at, on the left-hand side, the region of the retina which sits directly adjacent to where the optic nerve exits the eyeball. So here's the optic nerve with its axons in it. You know about the optic nerve as a cranial nerve. And we're looking at the bit of the retina that sits adjacent to it. Um, a few things I want to point out before we talk about the layers of the retina in detail. Firstly, you need to appreciate that the, the vertebrate retina okay, specifically the mammalian retina that we're looking at in this case, is uh, back to front, okay? So light enters the retina, and first it has to pass through um, axons, then some other neuronal cells, and, uh, and then lots of other bits and pieces before it eventually is able to interact with the photoreceptors. So the vertebrate receptor is back to front, all right? And this is just one example of... Um, an evolutionary mistake in inverted commas. If you look at the retina of cephalopods like octopuses and squids, what you actually find is that it's reversed. All right, so you discover that the photoreceptors sit here, and the axons sit here. So the photoreceptors do indeed hit the light first. So the cephalopods got it right, the vertebrates got it wrong. Okay, uh, but that's an aside. The other thing I want you to note. Um, is that here's the optic nerve, and the optic nerve does not have any photoreceptors, okay? So where the optic nerve leaves the eyeball, there are no photoreceptors, and this is your blind spot, all right? So this is basic stuff that, that I'm sure you were already aware of. Now, the retina has um, a number of different layers, eight layers in all, okay? Um, I've no expectation that you learn all of the layers of the retina uh, and we're going to just talk about them in very uh, general terms okay so let's go from um, the layer one here to the left okay moving leftwards so what we've got in layer one these are the retinal pigment epithelial cells these are the pigment epithelial cells okay uh, and these contain a pigment melanin uh, and that melanin is very important um, to prevent excessive reflections within the eyeball itself, okay? If you don't have melanin in your pigment epithelium, um, you actually really struggle in, in bright conditions. And we see this in people who've got albinism, albinos. Albinos don't have melanin in the retinal pigment epithelium. And as a consequence, you often see them needing to wear sunglasses, because too much light results in many, many internal reflections within the eyeball uh, and everything appears way too bright. So the pigment epithelial cells are important from that respect. And you'll also notice that the um, photoreceptor cells here in green and pinky purple are embedded in the pigment epithelium. So the pigment epithelium is also responsible for some element of maintenance of the uh, photoreceptors. Here are the photoreceptors themselves, okay? Um, there's a lot of detail you could go into with respect to these. Um, there are two basic types, the uh, rods in green and the cones in pinky purple. Uh, the rods are responsible for kind of black and white vision, and they're more sensitive, so we tend to see using rods during the night. Um, whereas the cones are responsible for our colour vision, but aren't very good in low light conditions. And that's why um, you see in monochrome um, at night, you don't see in colour at night because your cones aren't able to detect low light intensities. So here are our photoreceptor cells. And the photoreceptor cells interact with a sensory neurone which we can see an example of here and here, and these are bipolar neurons, okay? These are bipolar neurons, and bi the bipolar neurons collect information from a small number of photoreceptor cells. So there's, there's, there's an element of convergence going on here. 
a small number of photoreceptors are converging onto a single bipolar neuron. <coughs> and then the bipolar neurons in turn interact with the ganglion cells, the retinal ganglion cells. And it's the axons of the retinal ganglion cells which go and form the optic nerve itself. Okay, so the ganglion cells form the optic nerve. And we're going to do a lot more detail on the visual pathways and what happens to these ganglion cell axons when they enter the brain. Um, if we want to draw an analogy with the, the somatosensory system, and this would be a relatively loose analogy, the bipolar neurons we can think of as the first order sensory neurons and the ganglion cells are the second order sensory neurons if we're drawing an analogy with the somatosensory system. Okay? Therefore, the third order neurons in this system would be the neuron sitting in the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is indeed a part of the, the thalamus. So may maybe the analogy isn't that bad after all. So those are the basic the basic neuronal elements of the retina. Um, I just want to draw your attention to one more cell type, and that's the horizontal cell here. Now, the horizontal cells, uh, and they're loosely related to the amacrine cells as well, but I'm not so worried about amacrine cells because their functions are more varied and, and a little bit more mysterious. But the horizontal cells are interesting because these are inhibitory interneurons. Um, and the horizontal cells are responsible for helping with edge detection and increasing contrast, okay? Because what they do is they're responsible for lateral inhibition in the retina. It might come as a surprise to you, actually, that even at the level of the retina, um, we are processing the image, okay? So the retina does do quite a bit of computation before anything gets to the brain. And the horizontal cells are important for... Um, emphasising contrast by using the principle of lateral inhibition. So that's all I want to talk to you about with regard to the layers of the retina. Um, let's take another look now, a look now at some other parts of the eyeball, looking at the top right images here. Um, once again, we can see this is the back of the eyeball. This is where the optic nerve is going in, OK? What we call the optic disc is at this point here where the optic nerve goes in. And then we can see here is a region called the fovea. Okay, this is the fovea. And the fovea has been magnified in the lower image here. Okay, and the fovea is a very interesting part of the retina because it is at the fovea where we have the highest density of photoreceptors and the highest visual acuity is represented in the fovea. Okay, and... How do we manage this? Well, what we have is we have a high density of cones in the fovea. And cones, as we said, work in, in, in bright light conditions. They see in colour and they're also very good um, at giving us kind of high resolution vision. OK, the rods on their own give us relatively poor resolution, whereas the cones give us really um, good quality vision. So that's why the fovea has a, 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 a rich cone content an additional factor that helps us that helps us at the fovea is that we don't have this thick layer of ganglion cell axons here okay you'll notice there's a little pit okay and this is we've got this pit because we don't have the all the ganglion cell axons that we have elsewhere in the retina and this means that there's less of an impediment for light to reach these cones okay so this region, the fovea, is very important. And if you have disease in the fovea, then you can end up with, um, for example, a central scotoma where we've lost the vision right in the centre of the visual field, um, where it's arguably the most important. So those are some more aspects of the retina. Okay, You can see many of these structures when you look into the back of someone's eye using an ophthalmoscope. And that's what the image at the bottom right is showing. Okay, So we're looking at the back of someone's eye using an ophthalmoscope. In your clinical years, you'll be expected to become quite proficient in the use of this instrument. Um, and it's really important that you practice to get that right. What can we see? Well, if we follow the vessels, these are all blood vessels here. If we follow the blood vessels 
in towards the centre, we find that they all converge at this point. And this is the optic disc, OK? This is where the optic nerve is coming out of the eye, OK? The optic disc. And it's important that you are able to ascertain what a normal optic disc looks like because a swollen optic disc, something called papilledema, is an important clinical sign of raised intracranial pressure. So here's the optic disc where the axons of the optic nerve are leaving the eyeball. Here is our fovea, which is the very central part of a region of the eye called the macula, sometimes called the macula densa. We can see these darkly coloured retinal veins and these more lightly coloured retinal arteries. And we can also see um, in, a, in a kind of haze in the background the dark pigment epithelium. So you can see this dark pigment epithelium. Finally, I'd like to just point out a couple more um, clinical correlates for the retina. Um, most of you will have heard of a detached retina or retinal detachment. Now, there are, there are many different types of retinal detachment, but a common one um, is where the photoreceptors separate from the underlying pigment epithelium, and we can have fluid building up between those two layers as they separate. So effectively, what we have in a retinal detachment is separation of, of the, the neural retina um, from the, the pigment layers. And this can present with um, sudden blurring or loss, loss of vision, for example, or, or see, seeing um, stars or other uh, visual artefacts. So that's a retinal detachment. Um, another thing that you need to be aware of um, is a condition known as amaurosis fugax. And let's just write that down. Amaurosis fugax or fugax, fugax. Um, and what this refers to is a sudden transient loss of vision. And essentially it's caused by a transient ischemic attack um, a small embolus which temporarily blocks the um, ophthalmic artery which enters um, at here at the optic disc and then branches out to supply all parts of the retina. And the classic um, description that patients give of amaurosis fugax is like a curtain coming down over their vision, okay, only to return again um, within some hours. Okay, and that's caused by hypoxia of the retina, so the photoreceptors and the neurons aren't able to do their work. And that's a really important clinical condition that you need to be aware of because it could be um, a prelude to a bigger stroke. Okay, so that's all I've got to say on the retina. Thank you.